believe that the federal government should be the right size. It's, it's growing and growing enormously, well beyond the rate of inflation, well beyond the rate that the taxpayers can afford. So I believe we need a federal government that's the right size, that spends less, and that taxes less. And a federal government that expects greater responsibility of the individual citizen and therefore can provide individual liberties and freedoms to the citizen because they haven't been usurped by the federal government. The other side of the aisle, generally speaking, wants a larger federal government with a greater role in their individual lives. A couple of examples you've seen in the last couple of years, a stimulus bill to spend $850 billion to, what my opponent says, boost the economy. When she says she wants to boost the economy, it means she wants to reach in your pocket, tax you higher, send the dollars to Washington to create economic activity. But the result was that that 2009 stimulus bill, no jobs were created, no permanent, long-term, family-sustaining good jobs, no shovel-ready jobs. Less than 4% of the money spent actually went to construction. So they want a larger federal government that taxes more, spends more, and takes away more of your personal income. I subscribe to the philosophy of President Abraham Lincoln, who said the role of government is to do for individuals what they cannot do for themselves, not what they will not do, but what they can do. Building the Transcontinental Railroad in his time, so national rail, highways, roads, bridge construction, interstate commerce, securing the national defense, taking care of those important federal priorities that we as individuals can't do on our own. That's the role of the federal government. The other party wants a much more expansive role and when you get the expansive role, you get the higher taxes and the out-of-control spending and the lack of accountability that leads to wasteful spending and lack of control. Mrs. Bookbar? Thank you. I would disagree with Congressman Fitzpatrick over his characterization of me and my view of the role of the federal government. I'm not looking for a more expanded role, Congressman. I'm looking for a smarter role. And as a small business owner, that's what I've always done. I know how hard it is to make the tough decisions that need to be made. And look, as a business owner, you know you have to balance your budget. You know that there are going to be expenditures that are tough and that you need to look at revenue. I, to me, my whole, my business philosophy has always been we're all in this together. And frankly, that America is stronger. We're all stronger if we, if we abide by that philosophy. And what does that mean? So it means doing things right now, this current Congress and Congressman Fitzpatrick voted for things like the Ryan budget, the Paul Ryan budget. This is a budget that to me is exactly the wrong approach for America. Because what does it do? It puts, it, it, it prioritizes billionaires and big oil companies and special interests. And it does that at the expense of the rest of us. And so if you look at what it does for Medicare, this is a, this is a budget that would end Medicare as we know it. The Wall Street Journal said it would essentially end Medicare. And it would cause seniors to pay thousands of dollars more for health, for health care every year. It would slash Medicaid in half, putting our most vulnerable citizens, our disabled and senior citizens, and I'll tell you, there are tens of thousands of people in this district alone who rely on Medicaid for emergency room visits and for nursing home visits. It would make it harder for middle class families to send their kids to college. All of this so that we continue to provide tax breaks and subsidies to billionaires and big oil companies. I would submit that that does not make America strong. That is not a way that we're all in this together, and that's exactly the wrong approach for this country and this district. Uh, one minute. I would uh, significantly disagree with the characterization of the, of the budget passed by the House Republicans, but agree or disagree with the budget. I know my opponent must agree that it's the only budget resolution that has passed either House in the last three years. We passed the budget this year, we passed the budget last year. The reason I spoke earlier about the importance of passing the budget it's not an easy document to pass. They're full of tough choices, especially in a difficult economy. But we had the guts to put a plan on the table and actually debate it and pass it. And my opponent's party hasn't passed the budget in over three years. Her characterization of the budget is wrong. I'll tell you what, what the House budget prioritizes, to my opponent's word. It prioritizes the future. It prioritizes the future for the students in this room. And if you think a $16 trillion national debt, which if we send a current
So I would say if we really want to look at our children's future, and I've got a 13-year-old daughter, so I look, at, I look at her all the time, and frankly, looking at her is what motivates me through a lot of these thought processes. And I'll tell you, anybody who's ever been in a hole, anybody who knows what it's like to be underwater, knows that the best way to get out from that is by looking at both ends of the spectrum. And if you're looking at our children's future, Congressman, if you've studied the deficit and how the projections look over the next 10 years, Let's talk about ending the Bush tax cuts for the wealthiest one to two percent of America. This is this is a common sense approach. You need to look at both cutting costs on the one side and bringing in more revenue on the other side. And if we don't do that, we are giving up a one trillion dollars, Congressman. That's my daughter's future. That's because President Bush sent us to war without paying for it, with cutting taxes at the same time. And those taxes added more to our current deficit. Those tax, those tax breaks for the wealthiest Americans added more to our deficit than the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. We need to fix this for our children. Thank you. Our third question returns us to the issue of gridlock over the federal budget. So we're going to pick up from where we just were. Republicans blame the alarming deficit in national debt mainly on the unsustainable growth of entitlements. And Democrats blame two unfunded wars and tax cuts for the so-called rich. The general public is growing weary of the finger pointing. The consensus among many economists is that it is impossible to balance the budget without a shared sacrifice of budget cuts and tax increases. So I ask you, Mrs. Bookbar, and then Mr. Fitzpatrick, Congressman Fitzpatrick, Mrs. Bookbar, what non-defense budget cuts would you support? And Congressman Fitzpatrick, what additional sources of tax revenue are you willing to enact? This is Book Bar's first. Thanks. This is exactly this perfect follow-up from what I was just talking about. Shared sacrifice, we're all in this together. And you know, I don't I again I started out earlier saying I don't look at ideas as Republican ideas or Democratic ideas. We need to look at all good ideas because this is a critical, critical issue we have before us today. And so, yes, in addition to the revenue side, we absolutely have to make cuts. But we have to make smart cuts. cuts. We have to make smart cuts that are not on the backs of those most vulnerable. So what would I do? How much time do you have? I mean, first of all, I'd start with ending the tax subsidies for big oil and gas companies. The big oil and gas companies have been making record profits. They don't need our subsidies anymore. Second, I would look at the GAO just came out with its annual report on all the waste and duplication in government. If you're, you know, if you're really interested in learning all the ways that the government is not being run like a business, or if you're having trouble falling asleep at night, this is a really good report to read. And it tells you, I mean, it's scary, frankly. You read it and you realize how, how not well the government is being run on the administrative side. So there are, there are so many examples of programs that are being duplicated um, across you know, 50 different agencies that you couldn't believe that they couldn't consolidate it and be both more effective and save costs. I would look at other things, like, for example, the federal taxes that are due. If we were to collect a quarter of the federal taxes that are owed but have been uncollected, and if we were to put up for bid a third of the no-bid contracts that are currently under contract by the government, we would shave a trillion dollars off of our deficit. Why aren't we taking why are we taking common sense approaches like that? I think as a business owner, that's the way I look at these things. So that's what the first approach that I would take. 